good afternoon, everyone. So we've had about a hundred people show in in the event, and we are on just over sixty at the moment. I think we'll give a few moments, just maybe see. Give you a chance to go. Um, as you as you would you please add your name and name in the chat here on the It's for record purposes and to ensure that you can earn CPD points for attending. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are really glad to join. Um, to those of you who are already in the in session, please add your name and name in chat area for the purpose of the that you can receive your CP certificate for in today's event. Okay, we'll be starting in the next minute. So, people just wait. 
key into your name and name in the chat area. Thank you. Hmm. No volume. Good. See some people are having. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, and not to waste time, I'd like to start and welcome you all. Uh, thank you for joining today's session. It's the first of its kind for the Groundwater Division um, for the Western Cape. <clears throat> I'd like to give a special thanks and welcome to some of the members from other parts of the country. Um, we have the pleasure of having our national chairperson with us today, Mr. Farnes Puri. Thank you for joining us. Um, just a few rules or a few important pointers for those who are new to Zoom. Um, please mute your mics or the co-host will be muting your mic so that we minimize interferences. Um, people are new to Groundwater Division, or if this is your first ever, you are welcome to join by the Groundwater Division. Um, so today we have Mrs. Lasher, she is from City of Cape Town, a resident PhD student at UWC, and she will be talking to us about Faith and transport of microplastics in groundwater. I will now hand over to Candice. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining. Um, okay. So I'll just get into it. Can, every, can you hear me, Sumaya? Everything's fine? Okay. Um, please forgive me. I'm very nervous. I haven't spoken to a lot of people in a long time. <laughs> it's been locked down for a few months now. <laughs> and uh, I also got out of my pajamas today for you guys. So yay, here we go. Um, so the title Fate and transport of microplastics in groundwater. Um, I'll just give you an overview of the literature review that I've done so far um, and a little bit of progress to date um, in terms of the project and, and what we've done so far. Yeah. So um, I'll go through outline quickly um, so we'll just go through research objectives and questions um, I'll, I'll chat about what microplastics are where we find them how they travel um, and then some of the properties like degradation transportation and then the fate um, we'll discuss um, a small uh, a short brief discussion on treatment of microplastics um, and then uh, potential risks, and then we'll go into the research design. So the research, research objectives and questions. So the main objective of the study is to determine whether microplastics um, present in groundwater will have a negative impact on an aquifer system. So um, I'll use two case studies. Um, I'm using the Cape Flat Aquifer 
and I'm using the Atlantis Aquifer. And so the following um, question, so we all know that with uh, the city of Cape Town is developing uh, two managed aquifer recharge schemes. Uh, or one is already developed, operating for almost 40 years now. The other one is the new one, which is your Atlantis managed aquifer recharge scheme. Um, so the study will definitely benefit um, the city in understanding and, and determining whether there will be an impact and then we know how to manage and control the problem. Um, so the following research questions uh, therefore form the basis of the study. Will microplastics move through the aquifers? Um, what is the fate of microplastics in the Cape Flats aquifer and in the Atlantis aquifer? Will microplastics influence the transport of, of hydrophobic toxins in an aquifer? And what is the best way to manage and or limit impact of microplastic contamination in these aquifers? So we just have a look at a scale. Um, what are microplastics? So we know that microplastics are synthetic polymers like plastics or el elastomers. Plastics, we're all familiar with them. So we've got HDPE, LDPE, polyethylene, um, uh, P PET. I'm not going to say these names because they're very tongue twisty. We've got PVC. As a hydrogeologist, we know PVC. We use it all the time in casings of well points and so forth. Um, so, and, and, and we know HDPE as well. Um, and then a lot of them, we see it every day, like look around you at this very moment, somewhere you are touching plastic or it's somewhere around you, there's just no running away from plastic. So it's all over. Um, and then plastics have additives in them. Why do they um, include additives in plastic? So it's either to make it flame resistant. So you'll have a flame retardant in. Um, you have long chains of polymers. So you've got cross-linking um, additives which, which um, join the chains. Um, you've got antioxidants so that they don't break down um, in certain environments. Um, you've got plasticizers, you've got stabilizers, so it can either make it flexible, it can make it hard. So that's why you add, so that's why they include additives to plastics. Um, and then, so basically, the overall topic is plastic, but then it's broken down into microplastics. So microplastics, um, according to a lot of research, and um, is anything between between five millimeters um, and 0 0.001 millimeter, which is one micrometer. Um, the scale on the side just gives you some kind of idea. Um, so here we've got from one millimeter to 2.5 centimeters, microplastic starts at the five millimeters. Um, and we've, we've just got a comparison to, to ants. And then we've got um, your micro sizes, which is you've got a comparison to dust mites. And then we've got nano sizes, which is your bacteria, your viruses, your DNA. So we get really, really small particles. Um, this research will focus on microplastics. Um, not sure we'll do nanoplastics. Um, it is, I mean, detecting it is a problem, or at least it's still something that, that we work, that's working, that the researchers are working on. So for the study, we'll work on microplastics. Um, and then plastics itself have different densities. So you've got like a really, really light plastic. So you've got your 0 0.06 density, um, which is natural rubbers. And then you've got um, a density of 2.2, which is your polytetrafluoroethylene. That um, they, they kind of, they use that to coat pans. So you've got the, also known as Teflon. Um, so plastics come in different types. It comes, it has different densities. 
Um, your microplastic itself comes in different shapes, and then it also has different colors. And I've mentioned this, that anything smaller than one micrometer uh, is then referred to as nanoplastics. So we've got a look, we have had a look at um, different types, shapes of microplastics. Um, and so we can see we've got fibers, um, but then fibers are also classified. You've got your clean cut edges of fiber, and then you've got your frayed edges of fiber. Um, then you've got your fiber bundles, and, and um, research shows that fiber bundles almost really like untangle, so they stay in that knot form. Then you've got your fragments, which um, occur in foam, as foam, and Sorry, oops, sorry, sorry. You've got fragments, so D, E, and F. You've got your rigid and your irregular fragments. And then you've got spheres, or known as beads. They're round and smooth. We've got pellets, also round and smooth, but they can also come in cylinder shapes. And then you've got your foams, um, which are flat, thin, and malleable. malleable. Um, and then you've got your foam, um, which is soft and compressible. I'm sure all of you are looking at this now and you can somewhat identify where specific shapes come from or what type of plastics is broken down from. Um, but then if you go further into microplastics, um, you will pick up that there are two sources. So you've got your primary source, of microplastic and you've got your secondary source of microplastics. So your primary source of microplastics is any plastic that is made with the intention to be really, really tiny. Um, and I've got two images there of, uh, you'll see over here, it's like some gel with very small polyethylene microbeads in them. Um, that is, you'll find them in face washes, um, exfoliating scrubs. So that's plastic, it's microbeads that they add in, in your cosmetics. Um, and it's made in that form, it's made to be small. Um, and then you've also got your glitter. And if you're a parent, you know that glitter sticks for a very long time. It's not fun. Um, so glitter is made in its micro form as well. Um, and then you've got pellets. So pellets are made, um, they make it small. I showed you a, a, a round pellet and then you've got the cylinder pellets. Um, they use that and they melt it to manufacture other plastic products. Um, and then we've got secondary uh, microplastics. Secondary micro, microplastics um, are plastic, uh, larger plastics. Um, they degrade from larger plastics. So they break down from large plastics. And I've also got examples on the side. So you can see um, plastic litter. Um, you can see synthetic materials like your synthetic grass. A lot of people are putting in synthetic grass during the drought. Um, and then you've got your rubber from tires. Um, and you've also got uh, synthetic fibers. Um, which are we 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 we've seen in um, in your clothing items. So uh, a lot of the um, PET uh, plastic bottles they you they recycle um, and they make like a micro fleece uh, jackets, the Kway micro fleece jacket, and all of them they 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 made from a recycled um, plastic. So um, in your washing in your washing machine, obviously you now have all your clothing items, um, and as it's washing, you've got some microfibers that they refer. Um, I've, I've indicated that microfibers will break down um, and and be discharged um, through your washing machine water. Um, some studies show uh, the, a study by Brown. Um, it all shows that 1,900 microplastics, um, microfibers, can be discharged by one synthetic item in one wash. So that 1,900 microfibers 
by one item in one wash. Um, just stop for a moment, think of how many times you do washing, think of how many clothing items is in that washing machine, and how many people we have living in the city, and, 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 and. We're all discharging, and it all goes to our treatment plants. Again, your micro beads, um, in, in, your, in your cosmetics, we wash our faces, it discharges to our water treatment plants. Um, the micro beads, they say you can expect between 4,500 and 94,000 particles can be released during a single use of cosmetic products. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of micro Fiber, um, beads, sorry, in there. Um, and then if you look at this diagram, we're looking at sources and we're looking at types of plastics, um, which kind of also tells me where it's coming from. So if I'm finding a lot of microfibers, I kind of start to think, okay, this seems to be, might be more just, um um, treated water or, or discharge coming from a treatment plant. Um, if I'm seeing a lot of particles, rubber, fine rubber particles, maybe it's coming from stormwater runoff um, because of roads and so forth. So it kind of gives me some idea of um, the distribution pathways. Um, so looking at a study, another study, um, this diagram is taken from the study. Um, but I've added a few extra um, arrows in, so we we know that um, there there could be potential distribution pathways pathways from the atmosphere directly to groundwater. Um, there's also uh, groundwater if there's microplastics in the groundwater, and we're using it for for agriculture. So there's a, a direct source. Um, the diagram also excludes direct links between um, your domestic industry and groundwater. And then the diagram also excludes uh, a direct link between your water treatment plant and groundwater. We know what the drought, um, and it, it's been, I mean, it's been a, a practice for years already, but with water scarcity, we're now seeing a lot of um, municipalities moving into managed aquifer recharge, um, either with treated wastewater or with stormwater. So we've added those links in as well. So just looking at occurrence of microplastic, I won't go into a, a, a lot of detail, but um, studies have come about for years now um, in the marine environment. So um, some of the first studies uh, where, where the term microplastics um, was introduced um, in around the 1980s, um, by uh, Peter Ryan and his team, um, they work on on in the marine environment, and so you can see there are quite a lot of studies that have been done in water um, in the marine environment, and then more um, more so um, we start to pick up on uh, freshwater environment. So we've seen. All around the world, they've done microplastic sampling in rivers, estuaries, wetlands. Um, we've um, it, 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 there's evidence to show that it's present in these freshwater environments. Um, and then I've also added in they've done sampling of tap water around the world, um, and and they found microplastics in the tap water around the world, treated water there's microplastics and the raw effluent, we know there's microplastics. Um, so, uh, but what about groundwater? So the study is about groundwater. Um, so the literature that I found on groundwater, I could only find two articles. Um, and so that's a little red line that I've added in, it's not to scale. Um, but it's, it just shows that there's very little information on groundwater and microplastics. 
So the two studies, the one done on a caustic aquifer, in fact, both of them, and the one is in uh, the USA, um, of the 17 sites that they sampled, they found um, microplastics in 16 of them um, with concentrations, the mean concentration is 6.4 particles per liter um, and the maximum of 15.2 particles per liter. I should mention that the, the, with the studies, there's often, we put it, no standardized protocol on how to do it. It's a new thing. So a lot of the studies will report um, in uh, an area, and then others will report um, particles per liter. So it's difficult to, to do a comparison between the studies because the units are not the same. Um, and then we've got, they found that um, microfibers in the study were smaller than um, 1.5 millimeters. Um, they identified four of the samples as being polyethylene and the rest were basically destroyed during the identification process. And then the study also highlighted that it, it um, fractured aquifers are also vulnerable to um, microplastic contamination. And then we've got a local study done by um, WRC in Port uh, It's a WRC study, sorry, done in Port Chipstrom where they sampled four balls and they found microplastics. Um, they divided it into particles and fibers. Um, and I assume particles is any of the other the fragments and um, pellets and so forth. Um, they found that with the particles, 80% um, of the particles in the groundwater were between 0 0.02 and 0 0.3 millimeters. And then 20% is, is slightly higher. You can see from the graph. Whereas with the fibers, um, they appear across all size ranges um, and of the, the, with a the maximum above greater than um, 1.5 millimeters. So now we know um, that they, they found microplastics in groundwater. Um, so now that kind of gave me some more motivation to go further and research a little bit more. So I look at degradation. So you've got your plastic, your bigger plastics. How do they become microplastics? So we've got degradation and deg the degradation process is split into two. The degradation process is split into two processes. So we've got abiotic processes and these biotic processes. The abiotic processes are divided into physical and chemical processes. Um, and the physical and chemical, the physical processes I've, I've indicated, you've got the breaks of forces, you've got your heating and cooling that can cause particles to break down, freezing, thawing, wetting and drying as well. And then with the chemical processes, you've got uh, photodegradation um, by UV light, oxidation and or hydrolysis. Um, and then you've also got your biotic processes, which, which relies on microbials um, to break down the plastics. Now, some plastics um, have additives in and um, makes, make them kind of resistant to, to um, oxidation and so forth. Um, and, and, and then the, it makes them stronger, they don't break down. Um, however, if you look at the degradation processes, um, the, the biotic process in some instance rely on the abiotic process first. So it would go through the whole abiotic process and it would break down into smaller pieces and then it becomes available for microbes um, to degrade even further. Um, but in some instances, it's not even available for microbes to degrade because of the composition of it. So we look at degradation further, and studies have showed that the, the degradation rate is the, the, the difference, the, the, the differential mass per unit time. 
Um, so that's how they determine degradation rates. Um, degradation, so what does it do to the plastic? It alters the size, it alters the total surface area, the mass, the surface roughness, the molecular weight, and the charge of that plastic. So the diagram uh, um, just shows a uh, total surface area, an example of total surface area. So if we have a particle that's one centimeter by one centimeter, the total surface area is six centimeters squared. However, if this particle now breaks down, degrades into smaller particles of 0.5 centimeters, um, the total surface area of that whole particle of all the particles that now made up that one particle is 12 centimeters squared. But if you break it down further, um, the total surface area becomes 17 centimeters squared. So we can see that the volume remains the same, but the total surface area increases. Now, why is this important? So the impact of degradation, according to studies, have showed that the decrease, the decrease in the plastic size will result in faster degradation due to higher reactivities. Um, it also, as it degrades, it releases ketone groups and ester groups, which are additives in the plastics, and then it alters the surface roughness and it changes the charge of that particle, which now allows adsorption to occur. It changes the molecular weight of a polymer. So it's chemically modified from a polymer to an oligomer to a monomer. So it's now no longer a polymer. So what are we working with? Um, and then um, studies indicate that in some environments, the degradation process is really slow. So if it's slow, it means that there is a, a constant source of microplastics so it's a long-term threat to the environment so it's there and it's slowly degrading but it's continuously providing that source of microplastics to wherever so this is just an example of different types of plastics we can see pet hdpe pvc um, and then the different colors indicate different environments so l um, represents landfills and compost soils, M is the marine environment, B is the biological environment, S is in sunlight. So we can see with fillers, without fillers, there are different degradation rates for different plastics in different environments. So we're working with something that's really complex and changes. Really the change um, is very sensitive to environments and, and, and types of plastics. So now that we know degradation, we know how the plastic particle was formed or processes that could form the particles, we look at transportation. Um, and so I found uh, transportation processes. This is just an example of transportation processes in rivers. Um, so you've got your dense and your less dense, which would make it buoyant or non-buoyant um, particles. So your non-buoyant particles, it comes into the river and it can settle immediately. So you've got number one, which refers to your turbulent transport. You've got number two, which refers to settling. You've got number three, which refers to your aggregation process. And then number two again, because not like even if it can settle further. You've got um, number four, biofouling, also leading to um, settling. And then you've got uh, five, which is resuspension, and you've got six, which is burial. Um, so it can be embedded into the, into the, 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 the sands in the, in the river systems, but again, it can, be, it, can re, it can resurface basically, and then undergo that process again. Um, Sorry, that's non-buoyant. And then you've got your buoyant ones. Um, so you've got your turbulent process, um, but obviously it's buoyant, so it's not going to settle. So it needs other particles to attach to it to make it, to make it heavier, and then it settles down 
um, and then you've got biofouling as well, um, and then you've got your burial and you've got your resuspension again. Um, but also noting that um, these are obviously <coughs> flowing rivers, um, but you've got rivers that dry up in some seasons. So as the, 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 the level lowers in your river, you're obviously going to have settling of those microplastic particles into the beds of the rivers. Okay, so now we look at transport in groundwater. Um, and basically, I, I couldn't find anything about transport in groundwater. I did find an article that refers to earthworms um, creating preferential pathways and the microplastics could attach to the earthworm and the earthworm basically takes it lower down in the soil horizon. That's all I could find. Um, and so it led to further studies um, and it led to the, the study where um, he did an experiment, they did an experiment um on the fate of microplastics in soils so the aim of the study to, to determine if there was an impact of microplastics on the biophysical properties of the soil um, and so what they did was they conducted like a garden irrigation experiment um, and irrigated with water mixed with uh, polyacrylic fibers and beads and polyester fibers, polyethylene fragments, um, but this was for a loamy sand soil. Um, and then they measured certain properties um, and they found that the bulk density was affected and the water holding capacity was affected, the functional relationship between the microbial activity and water stable aggregates were, in, were, were affected. They did not see any um, change in hydraulic conductivity, but um, the study highlights that again, they used specific types of plastics, specific sizes in a specific soil. So this, it doesn't imply that um, irrigation of a source with microplastics will not have a change on hydraulic conductivity. Um, it's just in the specific environment. So it led to microsphere studies. So um, we know that microplastics are small particles. We know the sizes. Um, so we looked at studies, colloid, colloidal studies or microsphere studies um, in groundwater, which are particles more um, in the lower range of microplastics to nanoplastics. Um, and so there's been studies over the past few years where they used a fluorescent carboxylate modified microsphere, which is uh, polystyrene or latex, latex beads. Um, and they use these as um, traces in, in, in groundwater experiments to determine the transport model of bacteria. So they use the tracer with the bacteria with another tracer um, and they, they wanted to see if this specific microsphere could be used um, as, a, as a substitute uh, or tracer to which would resemble um, um, bacteria in, in groundwater. Um, and so the study in 1986, they performed a, a forced and natural gradient tracer tests using these microspheres, as well as um, bromide and chloride. Um, the microspheres were uncharged and some of them were negatively charged as well. Um, and they found um, that the microspheres um, were moving in, in, in the aquifer and there was visible retardation and attenuation as well. And um, the, 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 the other traces, the bromide and chloride, um, the, the peaks came through faster, like several nine, nine, eight to nine days faster um, than the microspheres. Uh, the bacteria also came through faster than the microspheres. 
So moving further into microspheres, because it seems as though there's some resemblance between the microplastic that they use, uh, between microplastic and the microsphere that they use. Um, and so we went further into these studies and we found that um, the transport of these microspheres um, was controlled by the water, the pore water velocity and the attachment or detachment um, to, the, to aquifer sediments. Um, it led to, in some of the studies, they did column experiments and they found that there was a decrease in, in hydraulic conductivity when they injected these microspheres um, into, the, into, the, into the columns. Um, and then the, the column experiment also showed the, the, that the permeability of the porous media is reduced significantly when they just add like even a smallest amount of, of these microspheres into, the, into the, the experiment, they immediately noticed a change. Um, and so they assumed that it, it was because of um, clotting at the pore throat. So this is just an image of the, the microsphere that was used. And they, there's an assumption that at the pore throat, the colloid will um, kind of clog that pore and then reduce that flow. And so um, it also, the, the clogging, I mean, in, in these studies is also referred to as straining in an aquifer. Um, and then we looked at different chemical stresses, um, what could change or impact the movement of these microspheres. And it was found that if there's a decrease in the ionic strength of the water, then there is uh, mobilization. So, um, and then there's also with an increase in, in the pH, uh, increase in concentration of surfactants and uh, dissolved organic matter, um, all of these can mobilize uh, the microsphere. Um, that, the ionic strength plays a role um, in the clogging as well. So um, it is something that must be considered um, when you are doing managed aquifer recharge. So we get to one of the other questions. Um, we have some hydrophobic toxins um, and they don't travel, they stay there. However, we are now thinking that if microplastics do have the ability to move in an aquifer, um, will uh, it adsorb and allow that toxin to move as well? So we found that colloid facilitated transport can lead to great to, to migration, great migration distances of hydrophobic contaminants. Um, so we know that these microspheres um, contaminants do adsorb to the microsphere and it moves it. Um, and then the further studies on microplastics itself found that ecotoxins um, also may absorb to the microplastic um, and resulting in transportation. That is specifically in um, the marine and, and surface open freshwater environments. Um, the microplastics with a higher surface area ratio, uh, higher surface area to volume ratio, have a higher adsorption capacity. So I showed you the diagram where you have a particle of one centimeter um, surface area, um, but if that particle breaks down, the surface area becomes bigger, and the more it breaks down, the bigger the surface area becomes. So if it has a, a bigger surface area, there's more um, areas for the, for, the, for the toxin to adsorb to now. Um, and then other properties of plastics influencing adsorption. Um, so when a particle is um, compounds are point zero charge, functional groups and acid base characters. Um, so these factors are all changed in a micro in a plastic um, when they degrade. So obviously making it available for adsorption then. So we looked at different types of toxins, and this is taken from various studies. 
Um, I'm not going to say these names. They are really big and really complicated to say. Um, but we are all familiar with PCBs, um, PHs, we know them, um, heavy metals. It was found that they, are, they all adsorb to microplastics. Um, and then there's also a study that shows that antibiotics and microbes also adsorb to, to microplastics. So just quickly looking at, I'm not going to go into treatment processes. But basically what was found is that the conventional treatment process is not capable of removing microplastics. Um, and then there are a few studies which, which show that um, the membrane bioreactors have a potential to remove uh, a large percentage, like uh, most of the studies are between 95 and 99% um, of microplastics, but these are all still um, anything that's greater than 0 0.02 millimeters. So anything smaller than that, there's a potential that it's not going to be removed. Um, so possibly your nano, my nano plastics. Um, and then um, the, in, the, in, in the studies, they showed that the common microplastics were microfibers and microbeads. Um, and, and as I've indicated, your microfibers are coming from your synthetic um, um, clothing items and then your microbeads coming from your um, cosmetics and um, also your, some of your detergents like your dishwasher and um, your, your washing machine um, um, pods as well. So, as I've mentioned, what about nanoplastics? Um, it's the bio, membrane bioreactors do not have the potential to remove that, and we haven't gone into this yet. Um, and then it also raises question about how do we manage or dispose the sludge uh, coming from the treatment process? Um, and also, uh, another thing to, to, to consider is that um, sludge is now being looked at um, to reuse as fertilizer in the agricultural area. So definitely we need to consider microplastics um, because that can be a direct link to your groundwater. And then um, how do we control or manage the source of the water coming into the plant? These are some questions that obviously need to be answered because um, you've got washing machines, you've got your discharge um, from your facial products and stuff. So how do you control that coming into the, to the treatment plants? So we looked at the potential risks and need, research needs. So we know that the change, there's a change in the soil biophysical properties, which can lead to erosion or water holding capacity. Um, or affect the water holding capacities. Um, movement of microplastic through the aquifer, that's a potential risk here. Um, <clears throat> potential clogging of an aquifer um, and the potential risk of microplastics facilitating the movement of hydrophobic toxins in an aquifer. And then as I've indicated to you previously, you have additives. Um, which makes the plastic, um, you can mold it, you can make it hard, you can make it flame resistant. Um, so these additives, um, they could leach during degradation. Um, and we've also found that some studies show some of the additives that, that are used in your PET bottles or so forth are carcinogenic and also they are endocrine disruptors. So the research design, after all of the research literature reviews that we've done, um, we, we're now looking at microplastics um, as a microsphere. And as we've seen in the microsphere studies, um, they do move, they do reduce hydraulic conductivity, and they do have the ability to clog. Um, so we 
are going to be doing um, field sampling in the Cape Flats and the Atlantis Aquifer area, but we'll, we won't only focus on groundwater, obviously, um, because the source comes from above. So we'll do groundwater sampling, surface water sampling, stor storm water, treated wastewater, and final process water. Um, we'll target areas that we think would have a higher potential of contributing, like your landfill sites, wastewater treatment, um, discharge points, and so forth. Um, we are looking at a plastic-free sampling process and analysis. Uh, processing and analysis, which is really, really difficult because everything has plastic in. Um, so with the sampling process, um, you have to look at your equipment. What equipment are you going to use? Does it contain plastic? Um, is this plastic that you would think would be in that environment? Um, do I now have to remove that plastic as something that I should also analyze for because it might be compromised by the equipment that I'm using. Um, the, the, the clothing that you're wearing could have plastic fibers in them. So um, we are looking at getting pure cotton, um, PPE, um, and then there's also no protocol available um, for groundwater. There is um, some standard uh, guide that 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 um, everyone is using and so we'll use that guide and adapt it um, and then also there, there is a guide for the microsphere studies to sample but um, from what I've seen uh, the equipment contains plastic as well so again we can't use that um, and then We've got field experiments and we've got lab experiments, and we'll we'll um, use the colloid transport model principle for these lab experiments, um, but we'll use microplastics. And then some of the challenges again: a plastic-free lab and uh, and and um, equipment, and then finding or, or at least getting a suitable size microplastic that you can use as a tracer. Um, and then, sorry, FCM is the fluorescent carboxylate modified microspheres. Uh, they are really expensive because their purpose is actually they use it in the medical field. So you need very small concentrations, which they would inject into your body to use as a tracer. Um, however, these uh, microspheres have been used in the groundwater uh, environment doing experiments, but they are very expensive. And then how do we detect the microplastic um, in these experiments or during these experiments? <clears throat> so progress to date, um, we are going to be using a lab at UWC to, to, to analyze the, or de to detect microplastics. Um, we've made some microplastics with PET material um and we also are exploiting the the, the 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 fluorescent properties of microplastics so um you can see in this image um the pet is is quite dense it's uh, i think it's got a density of 1.2 so it's going to definitely sink in water you can see the the, the small fluorescent uh, particles these are some of the microfibers that we've made in the lab um, from using PET. Um, and then we've also collected um, sand uh, in the Cape Flats aquifer and um, we filtered them and um, it's in preparation for the column experiments. Um, and then we've sourced funding for, for the sampling. Um, and then we've also, we are in the process of recru recruiting students. Um, so if anyone's interested, please pop me an email. And then the city is also um, supporting uh, me with the studies and they've now formed a co collaboration with the Netherlands. So there will be a living labs 
um, it, it has formed one of the living labs topics um, and, and it's done through the city of Cape Town as well. Um, and then, the, sorry, I didn't put this in the outline, but just looking at plastic bans or controls that's required. So, uh, you know, some of the issues we, we know and we see it all the time is uh, referring to the single use plastic, which end up on the landfills and all over the city. Um, and so there was a, 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 a charge imposed in 2004 on plastic bags. Um, but consumers just became uh, used to paying that. And so the, the, the charge now means nothing. Um, the plastic bag use has increased again. So it's either they need to increase the levy on that charge or do something else. Um, and then there is the, the National Department, Environmental, Department of Environmental Affairs. Um, they are busy looking at, um, uh, uh, sorry, re-looking at the, 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 the plastic bag legislation um, and also including all the other single-use plastics like your straws and so forth. And then uh, this is maybe just my opinion Opinion, but microbeads um, used in your cosmetics and detergents. My opinion that it should be banned. I'm not sure how they're going to manage that, but I would prefer it to be banned. Um, and then we also look at <clears throat> biodegradable plastics, which is now picking up. The research is picking up in that. Um, but I've also found that some studies show that. Um, they don't always decompose fully. Um, and then also the, there's no standardized time scale um, for the degradation in which the degradation occurs. And then we've got the synthetic textiles, which is your clothing items. Um, we'll have to determine how to control this um, and coming in from, from your domestic areas. Um, Provincial uh, Department of Environmental Affairs is working on a strategy and looking at uh, the mismanagement of plastic. So uh, hopefully whatever comes out from the study will also assist them in making decisions. And then, uh, well, we can all do our bit by um, awareness, um, letting people know uh, what the, the impacts of plastic are um, just being aware yourself of what you're buying, what you're using. Is it necessary? Do I really need to buy that bottled water or can I just take that water? <laughs> and that's coming from a city of Cape Town employee working in our water. So um, that is the end of my presentation. Um, and I think, Sumaya, we can open up for, for questions. Um, please go easy. Thank you, Candice, for that very informative presentation. We really enjoyed it. Um, so I guess we can welcome any questions or comments from the attendees. We have quite a number of you. Um, so you could either raise your hand, which you could find under the actions. Or if you're using your cell phone, there's something called more, where you can raise your hand. Um, yeah, as Candy said, please go, go easy on her. <laughs> well done, Candice. It was a really good presentation. Thank you. Do we have any, we have many comments. <laughs> Okay, we have Melissa Lindnar, Lindnar um, with a comment, and she says microbeads in Europe is already banned in wow. cosmetics. Maybe Candice, you can find out from the Dutch how they went about that. That's a question. No. Um, yes. yes. We have a question. 
I gained his battle fear of him. I saw a quick presentation of his input. Uh, just to finish him up. Sorry, any... Adolf, you, you're breaking up a bit and you're really soft. Can you hear me now? Can you ask that? I can hear you perfect. Thank you. Yes. Are there any are there ground are there any groundwater uh, groundwater sig uh, chemistry signature uh, related uh, associated with with this uh, with this contaminant? So, I mean, you can obviously look at your total suspended solids, um, but remembering that there are other particles um, floating around as well, which could then pick up when you are measuring total suspended solids and your turbidity. Um, so, uh, we are looking at um, something um, and it's work in progress and um, we, we, we will hopefully present um, to you guys in the near future um, what that results. Um, we are trying to determine if we can pick up a signature using specific um, parameters. Question from John Weaver. Yes. Can I go ahead? Yes, you may. Go for it, yes. You can go ahead, John. Thank you. Um, John Weaver here. Um, I'm obviously uh, a very uh, involved in the bottled water industry as I'm chairman of the, of the Bottled Water Association. And this uh, story of microplastics in water has been very much in the forefront of the bottled water industry. For the very simple reason that the only substance that researchers in microplastics can really look at is water. You can't really look at any other stuff that we consume like hamburgers and uh, yeah. Coca-Cola and whatever because you can't see the things. Yeah. So they're always, always, looking, they're always looking at water. So one of the things to be careful of is not to get to take the world's worries on your shoulder because everybody's looking at water. Um, it's just because they can that they do. And of course, with the bottle, in, bottle water industry, we really... You're breaking up? With the bottled water industry, um, it's it's a target of a lot of a lot of uh, uh, attacks. But okay, let's move away from that. One of the positives that I've picked up here is, uh, uh, and it only really struck me now. Thank you, Candice, for your for your talk. Is if your microplastics start clogging up in the aquifer, then they are going to they they are going to absorb. Uh, organic, harmful organic chemicals and retard them and let them flow through the aquifer much slower than they normally would, which is a really good thing. So microplastics is not necessarily in the groundwater, is not, not going to be such a bad idea. Uh, that's a comment I've got. Um, and last, last one, I've got one, one more other comment to make you, if I make. Sorry, two comments. And a, one comment and a question. Um, the other comment is that uh, two the, the two biggest contributors to to microplastics are and then we didn't I'll start that. again. Uh, the okay. biggest contributors of Um, John, would you maybe like to type your question? You seem to be breaking up. Your comment, sorry. Candice, we have quite a lot happening in, in the chat group. Um, there's a few questions here from Alana. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Will the city do any social research on willingness to change? Are you so, able to comment? So I can't, I can't answer on that. Um, uh, obviously, the city of Cape Town is really huge. It's got many departments, directorates, branches, units. 
um, I am really just within a very small unit um, in, in the bulk water branch. Um, and, and we are looking at this because we are doing managed aquifer recharge um, in, in, these, in the Cape Flats and the Atlantis area. So um, social, I, I, I really can't answer. <laughs> okay, thank you. I hope you've addressed the question for, I'm not a learner. Then we have Kes, who's asking, have you come across anything about whether the PVC casing used in primary aquifer boreholes could be a concern with regard to your sampling? So, it would definitely be a concern, um, but we are not targeting boreholes with PVC um, casings. I mean, so, I see Mikhail Clitter added to that one. Um, also looking at the various equipment used at wastewater treatment plants. Yes. Yes, so that's also, I mean, if you look at, at equipment used in, even in the bulk quarter, you've got your HDPE pipes um, used for your interest, linear infrastructure and stuff like that. So there are many contributors. Um, it's, 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 the fact is we, we the, the objective of the study is not to determine where it's coming from. Um, it's more an issue of what the impact will be and if there is an impact. Okay, thank you. Um, when we another, but there are many questions. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to go one at a time. Then we have Majola asking me, when do microplastics become a health risk? relative to exposure period of the long-term exposure or even short-term exposure? At which point is uh, this, this okay. is a health risk? Again, sorry, but I can't answer that. Um, there are other people doing studies on um, the toxicology um, you know, whether it is toxic to a uh, human, I mean, to the human health, to, to a human. Um, and, and I haven't looked at, at um, the risk to humans. Um, the research is only looking at the risk to aquifer properties. So apologies, I can't answer that. Okay, I hope you've addressed the question to the, for the person. Um, there's another, quite a few here, Candice. Um, uh, I have a question. Since microplastics is a relatively new contamination source in groundwater, can they be simulated using the current available geochemical transport and reactive modeling methods. Um, you you broke up, I didn't hear you there. Can they, I'm trying to look for that question as well. Okay, at 03.34 p.m. The person wants to know, oh, so. Hello? Hi, I'm okay. sorry, my, my dog is barking loudly. Okay, they want to know if it's possible for you to model microplastics, transport and reactive modeling. Um, so it depends obviously on, on how it responds in the aquifer. Um, is there something that, that responds in a similar manner that's been modeled and we can use that to model to model microplastics? Um, so, but but we, we have looked at the colloid uh, transport models um, and and uh, hopefully they 
they respond in a similar manner to these microspheres and we can use that. Okay, then there's another question here. Um, is there a way to determine whether microplastics detected um, is from PVC or from the aquifer itself? Um, okay, so I'm just trying to understand that question. So you want to know if it's from the PVC, the, the casing used, or okay. if it's coming from, from the aquifer itself. So for now, we, we don't, in terms of detecting microplastics, um, there are processes in detecting it. The source thereof, we don't know. But I mean, if you're going, if you're going to do maybe, if you do find, microplastics in in that specific area and it was a pvc casing um maybe broaden your your hydro sensors and look for um a ball in the area that is either an open ball or something a stainless steel casing or something and do sampling there as well um that's the only way but for now again um detection and sources and all of that it's it's all new um and so we're just taking it a step at a time. Um, you know, we need to know, is it, is it there? Is there an impact on the hydraulic properties? Um, and then what more research will be able to answer um, more, more of the questions? Um, obviously, um, Adolf asked about um, it using, using other parameters to to kind of give you some kind of indication as to whether it's uh, there is microplastics or not. Is there some kind of, of 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 indication that we can see? So using all of the information, we'll have to um, put everything together and 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 try and answer these questions. Because for now, there's just an endless amount of questions. As you've seen, there's really just two papers that I could found, find on um, microplastics and it's the two in the caustic aquifers showing and it just shows that microplastics um, is present and that's it. There's nothing about, um, you know, how we're going to detect it in situ or um, where it's coming from or what the contributors could be and if that is a contributor, how do I determine and if not. So there's, there's, there's just many questions. Um, and, and I think that is a start of a new era um, in research for, for, for all of us. Um, and as you can see by all of these questions, um, lots of research topics um, and hopefully many collaborations. I agree with you. There's so much interest in this chat through all these questions. People already wanted to see your next presentation. Um, we've got a question from him. Let's see. He's looking for microplastics in his mind. Yes. <laughs> Would you be able to address this question? Have you seen it? No, it's fine. Um, um, so they are, in, um, I can send you um, some of the methods that they use. Um, um, to detect microplastics, but it's again you, you you go you go out you sample ensure that your sampling does is not compromised by any plastic um, around you um, in the equipment that you're using, um, and then they, you can take it to a lab. The I can send you a the the the, the um, a manual, um, and it 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 basically. Um, depending on the water. Um, so you've got a specific type of microplastic. They might be dense, they might be uh, not less dense. Um, so there's a processing uh, technique um, that you would use first um, to separate your microplastics and your water and your organics in the water. And then thereafter you would go through either a density separation process or a filtration process, and that's to, to, to remove the microplastics now from, from your water or your sediments. 
um, and after that you would take your your sample um, and you would now you can either use um, FTIR uh, process analysis the Raman spectrum um, there's a few a few pro uh, methods that you can use to analyze it um, but there are limitations to a lot of them um, as you've seen um, the one um, um, research that was done in America where uh, a few of the samples were destroyed um, during the analysis process um, and that's I think due to thermal combustion um, so you need to you really need to select your your your, your analysis process um, uh, carefully because um, you could destroy the sample as well uh, but there are a, a few guidelines and um, I can I can send you what I've got and you can have a look and see if, if it will work um, in that environment. Great, yeah, that would, that would be fantastic. You could just email some stuff through, thanks. Perfect. Okay, we have a question, comment, I'm not sure, from Martin Jordan. Um, I think he's speaking to someone else, to Majola. It suspects that it's not only the microplastics themselves that are the problem, but the fact that pharmaceuticals can absorb to them and increase exposure. Do you have any comments on that? Yes, and, and, and that's um, one of the slides I indicated that um, antibiotics can absorb to the microplastic, um, whether, the, whether the antibiotic already had the ability to move um, in groundwater um, yes if it didn't um, and it now adsorbs to the microplastic and the microplastic can move through your aquifer then it does have the potential to spread the contaminant faster or okay thank you so much for very well with all of this. We have another question, two, two questions uh, from Regan Rose. What is the role of the unsaturated zone to help precipitate the microplastics out of solution before they enter the groundwater? That's a question. So I don't this know. process, sorry, can I? There's a second part. Okay. Will this process not cause clogging in the unsaturated zone with time? Uh, can, can you repeat that again for me? I didn't hear you were breaking up a bit. The first part, what is the role of the unsaturated zone to help precipitate the microplastics out of solution before they enter groundwater? I think that's what you're testing. <laughs> Will this yeah. process not cause clogging? That's the other yeah. So, so that is the, the, the point of the study. Um, we don't exactly. yet know. Um, the experiment done um, with the irrigation of microplastic solution on a loamy soil um, shows that the, there's a change in water holding capacity and there's a change in bulk density. Um, for the specific study, uh, there was no change in hydraulic conductivity, um, but again, that was in a loamy soil and uh, the study is, is in the Cape Flats and the Atlantis aquifer, so a different geology um, and we possibly using different um, plastic materials. Um, and different sizes. So the outcome of the study is to determine, um, you know, if it will clog um, or if it will move. Okay. Thank you very much, Candice. I think at this point we need to close the session. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today um, and just to reiterate that you needed to enter your name and surname to claim CPD points. Um, I'd like to close with some comments 
Um, well done, Candice. Great work. Great presentation. Very comprehensive study. Uh, I love these comments. <laughs> Thank you, Sumaya. And, and I mean, we'll also, we can go through some of the comments and see if we must any and try and address, and address. them. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. You thank were you. awesome. Thank you. And thank you to all our attendees. Thank you um, there, there will be many more sessions uh, while we are still in this lockdown. Uh, please don't hesitate to attend. Um, there will be sessions out for all regions. And I feel like regardless of where you are in the country, we, we can all join in these sessions. Candice, do you have any comments? No, thank you very much, Sumaya. And thanks to everyone that, that also joined and participated in all your questions. Um, you know, if there are any other questions and comments, I welcome them. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of questions and very little answers. Um, <laughs> so, so please uh, drop me an email um, and, and let's chat because this is how we grow and this is how we, we learn more. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I just need to ask all the participants to please uh, post feedback in the after event. Um, report. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Stay safe. Thank you. Stay indoors. Uh, Bye. Thanks, guys. Okay. Enjoyed that. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Cheers, bye.